Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, may as well get going. Um, we've got a, um, a, a good tight knit group here. I see uh, some familiar names. So uh, hello or hello again. Uh, hopefully we can uh, kind of get into, uh, you know, some, some good discussion here. Um, we've got probably about 40 minutes worth uh, kind of to cover uh, in both presentation and, and demo form, leaving the last one third or so for uh, just kind of open discussion. Um, you know, given that we look like a, a pretty small group, uh, I'd suggest, uh, you, you know, you can certainly toss any questions or thoughts into the chat uh, or use the little raise hand function. It always kind of helps us um, uh, just keep the conversation flowing um, toward the end. But anyway, uh, I'm Kevin Kane, um, SCAG staff and SCAG demographer. That's my primary role. I'm joined here by my esteemed colleague, Tom Vo uh, from SCAG's uh, planning strategy uh, department. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk to you about uh, a handful of our our, um, our latest planning tools and technical innovations uh, and, 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 and pulling a lot of these things uh, kind of together uh, under an umbrella of, of, of new planning data tools and, and engagement. Uh, so with that, I'm going to uh, share my screen and, and, uh, and get going here. All right, so thanks again for, um, you know, for coming, of course. Uh, we're going to start with a little bit of introduction to the regional data platform. This is a term that you may have heard um, uh, SCAG use from time to time, and uh, the local information services team that accompanies it spend just a couple of minutes uh, on some of our housing element supportive tools. I know that's a big deadline for a lot of local planning staff in the region coming in October. Um, a, a quick recap of a recent study we did with Cal Poly Pomona on estimating ADU physical capacity and demonstrating its linkage to uh, housing element process uh, and doing a demo of the new and improved version 2.0 of our helper tool, housing element parcel tool, uh, which was actually just released this morning uh, in time for this. So I think we've got a few kind of uh, themes that, that tie this work together. First of all, is to make existing data more useful. I know that's a theme in kind of a lot of civic data circles uh, and, and open data circles is that there's a bit of a mass uh, there. Uh, our parcel level land use data, 5.1 million rows and I don't know about a hundred or so columns probably would fall under that category. And one of our objectives has been to try to make it more useful. Uh, you know, for, for planning needs, that and other data sources, of course. Uh, connecting levels of government, uh, you know, we sit in a middle space uh, between local jurisdictions uh, and the state and the federal government and where else. Um, so there's always uh, 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 good, you know, things we can improve upon in terms of upward and downward information flow. Uh, uh, and third, this kind of emerged, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, what can be done to facilitate really broad understanding of places in Southern California, all the characteristics of them and, and how that intersects with our long range planning efforts. So I'm going to turn it over to Tom uh, for this first segment here. Hey, thanks, Kevin. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tom Vo. I'm a senior regional planner here at SCAG. Uh, as Kevin mentioned, I'm in the planning strategy department, and we work together collaboratively um, on different uh, very on different projects related to data and and uh, GIS. Um, and so today, I will be talking about the regional data platform and the local information services team. Uh, about ten minutes or so. Next, please. So the regional data platform grew out of a recognition that the region is facing unprecedented challenges like climate change, the housing crisis, transportation, and inequity to name a few. SCAG has long recognized that addressing these challenges has to happen from the ground up under a common vision to move the region forward. Next, please. That common vision is embodied in our recently adopted long range plan called Connect SoCal which is our flagship regional transportation plan sustainable community strategy, also known as RTP SCS for the region, charting a vision for 2020 to 2045. But the goals of Connect SoCal can only be realized if the individual cities and counties that make up the region are working collaboratively to create more sustainable communities. Next, please. 
So local jurisdiction general plans are the individual puzzle pieces that bring Connect SoCal to fruition and provide SCAG with up-to-date on-the-ground data for things like land use. So SCAG can do more accurate planning and forecasting for the region. Next, please. So the region success starts with the local planning efforts. And there is a symbiotic relationship between local planning and regional planning. However, there are challenges in this cycle, as you can see here on the slide. Local jurisdictions must complete and update a general plan for their communities, but many struggle to do so with the available resources and in-house tools. Without these updates coming from the local levels, SCAG is challenged to do the sophisticated forecasting and long-range plan, transportation, and sustainability planning for the region that we know for. Next, please. So in order to achieve the vision of Connect SoCal, SCAC is putting the groundwork in place for strong and coordinated local planning. The RDP is a vehicle to achieve the goals of Connect SoCal as the blueprint for the region. The RDP is, um, is the vehicle to achieve the goals for the Connect SoCal. So as you mentioned, the degree to which we can follow that blueprint comes down to collaboration and resources. To that end, the RDP is a platform for a smarter region focused on improving data sharing and collaboration and facilitating better planning at all levels. In addition, it seeks to support regionally aware local planning by providing modern tools, um, data, best practices for the, for the general plan updates. And it's also um, uh, inform regional planning by streamlining the process of collecting and integrating local general plan data from jurisdictions so SCAC can do a better regional planning. So ultimately, the RDP is about enabling SCAC member agencies with the next generation planning tools and technology so local governments like yourself can better, are better equipped with, address, um, with tools to address challenges like the housing crisis, climate change, equity, and economic recovery to move the region forward. Next, please. So now let's turn to the high level overview of the regional data platform solution to show you how these components come together. And now it's gonna get a little bit of technical, so just bear with me. Um, so the important to note that here, that the development of the RTP has been undertaken with significant input from member agencies. Outreach interviews with 10 local jurisdictions at the start of the project shift our understanding of the region's biggest planning challenges and opportunities for innovation and informs a solution that aims to meet the needs of local jurisdiction planners. Development is now happening in collaboration with nine of those 10 uh, pilot agencies. And these pilot agencies are the cities of Fullerton, Long Beach, Los Angeles, Pico Rivera, Eastvale, Barstow, and Ventura, as well as the Imperial and San Bernardino counties. With that in mind, I'd like to draw your attention here to these three key components represented by the blue, orange, and green colors on the slide. The blue is SCAG's new and evolving geospatial infrastructure. And these are the foundational components that support SCAG and member agencies. The regional information hub will serve as the primary portal into the RDP, providing one-stop shop access to data, tools, and information, as well as a workspace for collaboration among uh, around common goals and initiatives. This aspect of the RDP directly connected to SCAG strategic goal, um, plan goal, which is the uh, to be foremost data information hub for the region. And in orange are planning tools and engagement tools for the member agencies to use in local planning. These include focused tools for specific workflow and like the helper app for housing site selection and out of the box tools like the business analyst and RGS Urban that are intended to help with a multitude of common planning and engagement workflows. Finally, in green is data orchestration. And this is one of, this is the main component, uh, one of the main components uh, in the RDP uh, addresses one of the primary goals uh, of the project, which is to facilitate better data sharing between SCAG and member agencies. This component of the RDP strives to ensure that SCAG can gather the data it needs from 
jurisdictions in a more continuous and less burdensome way to keep our regional database as up to date as possible for the regional planning, as well as to make that data available back to jurisdictions to use as contextual layers for their own local planning. So this is part of the symbiotic cycle of data sharing that drives holistic planning for the region that we referred to earlier. Next slide. So finally, the RDP can then be thought of as the underlying geospatial infrastructure supporting all kinds of SCAG programs and initiatives. For example, here's how the other projects and programs that you will hear about today tie into and are powered by the RDP. Housing data from SCD or ACS can be discovered or accessed through the regional info hub and exposed in tools like Helper that Kevin will talk about today. Finally, the list local information services team, which I will talk about in a minute, is connected to the RDP through the regional info information hubs capability as a platform for engagement. Local jurisdictions can connect with SCAG's list to request technical assistance through a simple survey on the regional information hub, providing a more direct line for support and two ways conversation between SCAG and local jurisdictions. Next slide, please. So here's a screenshot of the helper tool that Kevin will talk about later. And as I mentioned, helper is powered by the RDP project. Next slide. Before passing it back to Kevin, I would like to also use this opportunity to talk to you about the local information services team or also known as LIST. And the purpose of LIST is to coordinate, plan and develop system to link SCAG's value added products such as data and application to address local information and analytical needs of SCAG local planners. Two, to deliver technical assistance for use of data tools and modeling. And three, provide opportunity for local governments to submit feedback on how SCAG can improve products for better collaboration. In short, the purpose of uh, LIST is to develop a team of skill planners to promote interactions of regional local planning, obtain feedback on SCAG value added planning and information products via one-on-one -on -one technical assistance. General, um, so one of the immediate products that we have now in list is the general plan technical assistance, which is to assist you with your general plan updates regarding housing, safety, and environmental justice. So if you'd like to learn more about list and have a detailed walkthrough of the data or the tools that we are presenting today, uh, please send in your request to list at ca uh, at skag.ca.gov and I have that uh, highlighted there for you. And now I would like to give it back to Kevin. All right, hey, thanks so much, Tom. Really appreciate it. Um, that's uh, that's the great kind of background of the overarching uh, regional data platform and kind of how how it links with some of our other you know supportive and new planning tools. I did want to spend just a few minutes here on uh, what we're labeling housing element supportive tools. You know, we know there's a gigantic lift for uh, the, a lot of uh, local jurisdictions uh, in Southern California, given that the state has set an aggressive target of 1.3 million housing units uh, into plans uh, in, 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 in the form of site inventories and housing elements by October 15th of this year, uh, as it stands currently. Um, so we, uh, during some of 2020, we kind of tried to uh, scramble to pull together as much supportive information and materials um, as we could, understanding that um, uh, procurements, contracting, interagency agreements, all those things take quite a bit of time uh, using the resources we had, uh, you know, as readily available as possible. And, and put out three tools that I, I've talked about and other, other staff, SCAG staff have, have talked about a number of occasions um, uh, before. The first is, is, is really just jurisdiction level data profiles, just calling this pre-certified local housing data. Um, the housing element itself, uh, you know, the, the state requirement has a section titled housing needs where you basically have to uh, assess a couple of dozen data points in your jurisdiction on, um, you know, you, you can see the, the categories there. Um, you, you know, the, the, by and large, the majority of this is ACS data, but there are several other sources. We just put this together um, for all 197 jurisdictions. It's really a series of 35 tables and figures uh, in, in eight categories here. And I should mention, uh, all of this stuff is available on the site uh, below there, skag.ca.gov slash housing hyphen elements, um, everything that I'm going to be talking about um, for the rest of this presentation today. 
Um, secondly, um, you know, we definitely know that there's going to be a lot of use of ADUs or accessory dwelling units um, for this kind of this upcoming planning cycle uh, in terms of satisfying housing needs and just, uh, you know, integrating these more um, more concretely into, into local plans. Uh, as far as kind of the state requirements are concerned for the housing element itself, two steps uh, are required to uh, use ADUs in the housing elements. First, how many ADUs do you envision in a local jurisdiction over the next eight-year planning period? And secondly, well, let's, we, we'll need to estimate the affordability of these units across the five um, income categories um, that the state and, and HUD uh, uses. Um, in terms of estimating the number of ADUs, um, you know, this uh, HCD, Housing and Community Development Department, provides some safe harbor assumptions based on past production. Um, you know, unfortunately, those are pretty low oftentimes. Um, and, and, you know, if uh, ADU production is to really ramp up and accelerate, those are probably quite low. Uh, so we definitely think that there, there, there are certainly some other alternatives here. Um, our discussion that I'm going to share with you in just a moment um, about ADU physical capacity. The intent of that is really to kind of get a sense of what ADU build out, if there is such a concept, could look like in a jurisdiction just based on parcel sizes uh, and, and configurations in some scenarios. Um, so that's, uh, we're hoping that that could be one tool to help generating uh, an estimate that's a little bit more forward looking than just backward looking. Um, as far as the affordability, though, we do have an analysis that's already pre-certified by the state. Certainly, there are a lot of ways to assess the affordability or potential affordability of any housing unit or any housing type. Uh, and ADUs are a little bit idiosyncratic. Uh, we did a pretty easy convenience-based <laughs> survey, I, I would say, uh, building a Craigslist scraper uh, to start off with um, and, and found 158 bona fide ADU rental listings uh, across the Skag region last year, um, did a keyword search and just, uh, you know, verified individually that these are actually ADUs, not necessarily a house with an ADU next to it. Uh, the rents that we found ranged from 650 bucks a month to 4,800, uh, a very fancy ADU in Mar Vista. Um, you have to put a few assumptions into this, uh, certainly to kind of translate uh, uh, ADU rent listings uh, into a breakdown across income categories. Uh, for one, we assumed that 15% uh, were occupied rent-free uh, by perhaps uh, you know, family members, college students, somebody else, something like that. Uh, and beyond that, we estimated an even split between one and two person households in, in, in ADUs. Um, this analysis relies on the, the HUD slash HCD 2019 income uh, thresholds. Basically, that's, that's to say, uh, you know, what rent, uh, for you know, a one, two, or, or whatever uh, person household um, would, would correspond to these five uh, uh, qualitative income categories here uh, assessed at the county level. Uh, and the table you see here is a state certified um, way to break down an estimate of ADUs across five income categories, and it meets uh, housing element statutory requirements again. Uh, that's posted on our website, the full analysis. Um, one kind of interesting conclusion here, uh, you know, even though this was kind of a convenient sample and, and we built this little survey uh, just to satisfy this statutory requirement, I think it's, it's kind of interesting to see, especially in some of the higher cost areas, you know, if you look at Orange County, for example, uh, or perhaps uh, LA County one, which are generally some of the higher cost areas within Los Angeles County, um, that listed ADU rents uh, tend to actually, uh, uh, you know, correlate with a lot of the, the low, very low or moderate uh, aspects. So that does speak to the notion that ADUs could actually be uh, a pretty good part of a, a, of a solution for, for moderate or lower income housing. Certainly ADUs are shared living. Uh, so in some sense, they're, they're expected to be a little lower um, uh, of a price point. But uh, that was somewhat of an interesting finding that, um, that we didn't necessarily go into this, you know, explicitly looking for. Um, the, uh, the next study that I kind of want to bring to you, as I mentioned, uh, is an assessment of ADU physical capacity. And, and Tom worked very closely with the team of folks from Cal Poly Pomona's Department of Ur Urban and Regional Planning. Um, my apologies for the nasty looking link there, uh, but we did just get this up uh, recently within the last week or so. And I think Tom, if you're able to post that in the chat, um, then, then folks can grab it a little bit more easily. Um, you know, this, this was, uh, you know, a, a project that we, we set about a while and, and kind of tried to pivot a little bit um, toward housing element support to the extent that we could. Um, uh, Do, uh, professors uh, Doe Kim, Sora Beck, and, and Brian Garcia from Cal Poly Pomona are the primary authors here. They did a, 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 a pretty extensive review of, of local ADU ordinances compared vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, state regulatory standards on ADUs. But ultimately, the meat of the analysis, and what I'm going to talk about a little bit more in the next few minutes, uh, is how this was used to generate um, uh, a potential number of ADUs that uh, there is physical capacity for uh, in the Skag region based on um, 
uh, based on parcel level land use data uh, that, that we have here. Um, in terms of the scope of this project overall, and please bear with me, I'm uh, reporting this, uh, this secondhand. Neither of us were members of the specific research team, although we were there during the process, um, was an assessment of best practices, uh, a review of uh, 68 local ordinances, and ultimately an ADU eligible parcel analysis. Um, it's focused solely on the physical conditions of parcels that can be queried and calculated in GIS. One caveat is that we only really look, were able to look at detached ADUs. There are a lot of other um, types of accessory dwelling units, junior ADUs, garage conversions, non-conforming ADUs that, man, at a regional scale, I, I, I struggle to wrap my head around how you're able to, how, how one may be able to comprehensively do this at a regional scale. Perhaps some more localized analyses um, would, would do better. But the bottom line is that this analysis is, is, um, is limited to, to detached ADUs only. An interesting point is that uh, you know ADUs are allowed in single family, multifamily, or mixed use zones. But when you're trying to assess that, and I'm sure there's, there are local planners in the audience who have more experience with the specifics on the ground but by, by a long margin than I do. Um, but one of the challenges you can kind of see illustrated here a little bit is, well, if you've got, for example, a common area uh, or something like that, how, how are you gonna really gauge how many ADUs may actually be able to fit on there? So strictly speaking, this assessment is the number of ADU eligible parcels, not the number of ADUs uh, that you can, because of, um, largely because of um, a big question mark in what could happen on, on multifamily or mixed use zone land. So uh, certainly some of the uh, some of the context and, and background here, um, you know, again, being a physical capacity oriented analysis, we don't really touch on the financial supports, the outreach and education, uh, and some of the urban design, uh, you know, foot, uh, uh, urban design considerations that that might go into account. But these are all, you know, key features in successful ADU delivery ultimately. Um, you know, a lot of cities, uh, from what we understand, too, do provide some pre-proof floor plans for ADUs. Uh, but even without those, standardized uh, designs can can be helpful uh, in in the process. Um, the research team here created 19 sample floor plans after reviewing some cases. So those can also kind of, those can also be found uh, in the full report, uh, which is linked there. Um, as are uh, there's a little bit more detail on kind of converting the state ADU standards in these various categories, lot size, uh, unit size, parking, et cetera, into what ended up being uh, a set of region-wide baseline assumptions for assessing ADU physical capacity. Uh, and again, I, I mentioned uh, there was also a review done um, of, um, of, of how local requirements, uh, uh, you know, correspond to state ones, although that was not the focus necessarily of, of uh, the physical capacity part of the analysis. This is really the meat of it um, to some level too. Um, you know, taking the 5.1 million or so parcels in Southern California, uh, if the buildable area of a parcel is larger than or equal to the needs for an ADU, we used 800 square feet uh, of a footprint uh, because that's, you know, was fairly standard, fairly reasonable mid-sized assumption, um, plus setbacks, plus a driveway, plus a required parking, then that parcel would be flagged as ADU eligible. Uh, so there's a nice little image of, of that here if the space behind there uh, is, is above that amount. So again, a fairly straightforward analysis when you actually think about it on the map. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, that's to say there are certainly a few different approaches in terms of some aspects of the, uh, the, the underlying data source used. Each county assessor has some slightly different information that makes its way into SCAG's regional database in a slightly different way. Um, certainly that goes through local review um, as well, um, because that is a strong component of development of this particular data source. But the bottom line is, um, you know, there are roughly 2.7 to 3 million ADU eligible parcels in, in the region um, based on this assessment. So an extremely high physical capacity um, if, you actually, uh, if, you, if you're actually thinking about it. Um, in addition to that, and, and as you'll see as, as we get into the helper demo in, in a few minutes, um, we did a little bit of work here, the research team did on um, kind of scenarios, uh, you know, are there some uh, you know, constraints or regulations that could be put into place or relaxed? And how, how would that change the physical uh, capacity estimate for ADUs? Uh, and there are six that were explored here. What if you change the setback from four feet, required setback from four feet to two feet? Uh, look at smaller ADUs, 600 rather than 800 square feet, remove the parking requirement. 
Those three were act are actually operationalized in the helper tool now. Um, there are three others that, that are not explicitly, but you can do a little bit in terms of the fire hazard zones and some of the other zonal considerations. Um, but, uh, you know, looking at that, and this is, again, one of these instances where we, we kind of see a nexus between putting uh, a tool together and seeing some interesting, a little more research-oriented type of conclusions. Um, uh, this this uh, line graph here uh, shows the six counties and uh, the uh, six, uh, I guess, uh, you know, including the baseline, seven different scenarios and how they vary. And, you know, what really stands out is that um, there's not too much variation in the number of ADU eligible parcels across the region, especially when you look at uh, LA and Orange counties, which kind of given, um, you know, given the, the arena allocations uh, and, and given the, the you know, uh, housing market considerations, those are probably the areas where we'd anticipate a lot more, uh, you know, ADU planning going on. The the, the, the one spike you see there in Ventura County and to some extent in Riverside County uh, is for a fire hazard uh, scenario, which would reduce pretty substantially uh, in some of those areas that abut natural lands. Um, the graph here is just a little bit of a take on that. And again, uh, what's interesting about this is, is you know, we, we just restricted the analysis here to SCAG's priority growth areas, which are a combination of high quality transit areas, neighborhood mobility areas, job centers, what have you. Um, and, and it's a fairly similar, uh, you know, overall uh, position here. But, uh, you know, an important point is that the, the helper tool does allow you to, to basically replicate this as well in a local jurisdiction and, and kind of restrict uh, the universe of ADUs to, to any particular areas along these lines. And again, you can see that there's surprisingly little variation uh, in some of these, you know, setback requirements, parking requirements, uh, what have you, in terms of the overall physical capacity um, uh, in the region. So the last thing I'm going to share with you in the in some of the remaining time I've gotten, I'll try to go fairly quickly here um, so that we can have time for, for questions. And, and I hope you're, you're able to link the tool and even play around with it as I, uh, as I share this. Tom can probably play, plop the link in the chat there for you. But is the housing element parcel tool? And, you know, as I mentioned uh, at the start, you know, we really see this as kind of an extension of the open data portal that, that we've got going. Um, you know, Helper is a web mapping application powered by SCAG parcel level land use data, uh, which is a combination of uh, the uh, uh, quadrennial uh, local input process uh, that we conducted for the past 2020 regional plan uh, uh, with some updates uh, based on assessor data that comes in a little bit more regularly than that. We originally released this uh, in December 2020, a version 1.0, but as of this morning, we've got a version 2.0 finally up there um, with some improvements. Uh, that have been worked on through the LISC team and through the outreach uh, of the regional data platform. Again, as Tom mentioned, there's a group of 10 pilot cities there. They provided us with good feedback on how to make this uh, more useful for local planning efforts. So hopefully um, some of the little improvements you see are, are in that vein. Um, here's just a smattering of, of some of the parcel attributes that you got here in Helper. Again, uh, really the bottom line is this is a spatial data set of 5.1 million rows and about 100 or so columns. Um, you've got a few things in here that uh, didn't necessarily make it into one of the visible filters in the helper tool, for example, slope or building footprint area, uh, but a lot of them are heat priority growth areas, environmental, environmental justice, what have you. Uh, we tried to take care uh, to, to make these uh, selectable overlays as, um, uh, you know, as, as, as consistent as possible with some of the, the, the EJ and TCAC opportunity standards as, and, and things like that. Uh, we also were able to integrate a little bit from the forthcoming uh, green print tool um, and, and just uh, to have this data in here to say whether or not a parcel is in uh, one of these areas as so defined just for, for information purposes. And, you know, really the logic of this application is to kind of take the open data uh, and, and, and kind of, you know, position it in a way so that you can uh, you know, screen sites based on uh, whether they're vacant, whether they're public owned, because again, that is kind of a state review requirement to assess public owned land to some extent, assessing them in the context of whether they're priority growth areas, constraint areas, proximity to services, what have you, uh, with some additional capability to refine that, uh, and also to download and to use in your own platforms or to, to patch into uh, your own web services. Um, and, and, you know, at the time, um, I don't know if Tom mentioned, but all local jurisdictions get as free licenses through us. Just email Tom or email list, <laughs> which I think emails Tom, right? <laughs> um, so with that being said, I'm going to go here uh, to Helper itself and uh, just walk through a few of the new features. Let's see if this opens nicely for me here. Okay, there we go. 
So this is your landing page. Um, it has already closed the, uh, the little splash screen of information uh, for you here. Uh, and um, just uh, kind of by way of some, some basic orientation, uh, at, at first, you're not actually going to be able to see uh, any parcels, but as you do zoom in to a, much, to a finer zoom level, uh, the parcels are going to start to actually show in uh, and render a little bit nicely. We just can't show all of them uh, at the region scaled map. The filters here are largely related to uh, housing opportunity and site selection. Um, standards saying that um, uh, parcels that are vacant, and uh, we have pre-selected four vacant categories that we have, and between the size threshold uh, can be included for lower income housing without further review. Um, so that uh, clearly identifies them. You also have a little info tab for some more information on each of these filters, public owned lands, lower value commercial retail, um, uh, and some of the environmental sensitivity uh, opportunity types of information are, are here as filters as well. Um, keep in mind the number of parcels you have active is always here on the bottom and you can download, uh, I think you can actually download all 5.1 million. Um, it, it's just uh, built for operating on a, a single jurisdiction at a time. So I'll, um, I'll zoom into the city of Corona right here uh, so, that we can, um, so that we can see the parcels in Corona. I'll keep in mind full document. Kevin, uh, here you're up here on the top right. You got a legend. Um, let's see. I think my show. Edward. Yeah. Uh, can, you, can you turn off your camera? I think um, your bandwidth. You have a bandwidth issue. You're you're cutting off. Sounds good. Yeah, connection unstable. Warming that. That means uh, that means Tom to be uh, should be ready to. <laughs> I'm ready, but I think you're. Uh, we, we can hear you fine now, Kevin. Over right uh, with the. Uh, well, I just hope the uh, the rendering is uh, uh, is quick enough in the application itself. So I had. Uh, uh, I had kind of been demoing up here in the, the city of Corona, showing some of the new functionality that we've got here. Uh, and you can see a legend uh, that should pop up uh, with, you know, yellow being typically single family. And one of the new should be showing the map layers. And uh, I promise you, this is a, a connectivity. You can uh, go into this. Uh, oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, so, uh, you know, one of the new features is that you can actually render uh, for example, 2045 high quality transit areas uh, on top. Top of this, and, and you know, we limited the rendering options uh, just uh, so that you could see the parcels and cell layers. Um, one of the nice things is that. Uh, Uh, you know, you can pair Hey, Kevin. Things such as job centers, neighborhood mobility area. Yep. Hey, I, I think it's, uh, it, it, we can't really hear you that well. I think you keep breaking up um, the connection. Uh, my, my apologies on that. Are you still able to uh, see Corona zoomed into high quality transit areas? Yeah, we can see it better now, but earlier it was kind of breaking up a bit. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll go through for a few minutes, and then Tom, if you wanted, um, if uh, if I if I drop off or I'm unintelligible, or if you want to take over for the last few minutes of the demo and share, um, how does that sound? Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> All right. So, um, just 
giving an example of some of the slightly additional functionality that we've got here, you know, and 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 you can uh, double up, uh, uh, you know, some of these as well. If I wanted to just look at lower valued commercial retail, again, a uh, good idea to check the info tab for, for what these represent. This is a lower improvement to land value ratio, and this will restrict the city of Corona um, within high quality transit areas and also lower valued commercial retail. Uh, you know, if you wanted to download and assess these sites uh, um, uh, in more detail, that, that option is available uh, here for you too. You also have the convenient little snapshot button where you can take a screenshot uh, of the existing thing. Uh, and a new uh, uh, info pane here for the jurisdiction. And, and the hope with these features is to provide a little bit more um, uh, information that can be used uh, in presentations or, or what have you, uh, kind of about some key housing statistics, uh, arena allocations, whatever. Uh, and this infographic can be exported uh, and edited a little bit uh, to make it a little bit more useful too. So I wanted to zoom over uh, across the region a little bit to the city of Santa Monica. Uh, a fairly good demo one because uh, you know folks tend to go to Santa Monica from time to time, so there's a little bit more regional familiarity with it. Um, there are, I think, 11 uh, filters here that are considered environmentally sensitive areas, fire hazards, sea level inundation rise. I'm just going to click all of them on right now. Uh, and this one takes a little but it gives a really interesting uh, map of Santa Monica based on the, the, the parcels that are in none of these zones here. Uh, there you can see it popping up. Um, and I want to take this chance to also uh, put in our, our job centers layer as an overlay here, um, uh, which is uh, part of Connect SoCal, our, our priority growth layers. And this is the first time we've actually had the full polygons uh, available for viewing here. Uh, so hypothetically, you can uh, do even a little bit more visualization uh, or, or assessment uh, based on uh, the job centers or other layers. The last thing I want to touch on is uh, the new ADU functionality. You may have seen this section of ADU filters um, that are here. And I'm going to zoom over to the city of Hermosa Beach, just a little bit south of Santa Monica. Um, and take a look at this ADU filters section. I mentioned uh, there are some baseline assumptions. These baseline assumptions correspond directly to that Cal Poly Pomona study. Um, this would suggest that there are 1,043 parcels in the city of Hermosa Beach that are um, ADU eligible per that standard. You can uh, tinker around with smaller ADUs. Reduce setbacks or whatever. If you want the most lenient, um, uh, we said, we said uh, 1,000. Uh, which uh, again, this is a little bit used to beach. They tend to have particularly tight parcels, which may not uh, accommodate. Maybe you. Um, and uh, just vacant parcels filter actually allows you to have a uh, type of view there too. Um, now the last wrinkle on ADUs, I wanted to zoom over to the city of Claremont here, um, because I mentioned, uh, you know, the, the, the Cal Poly study is, is somewhat of a sense of what, what's, uh, what does uh, ADU build out look like for detached ADUs. And if I take a city of Claremont, uh, Um, and do my baseline assumption for all, and the response time is, is my internet, uh, I think, uh, rather than, oh, uh, there we go, 6,878 parcels um, given the baseline assumption. If I wanted to perhaps do something like, uh, well, environmental justice would also go here into my standard filters uh, and, and, um, and, and only select those, sorry, outside of environmental justice areas. So I want, no environmental justice areas ambivalent to the other two put on this filter. And you can see here um, that the number is going to go down a little bit to 6,410. And it's going to exclude uh, any of the parcels in here and that as well. Uh, and perhaps I wanted to just uh, you know envision only the uh, perhaps only the highest resource areas and see how many uh, how much physical capacity for ADUs there is there. 
So I would go to inside higher opportunity areas. Maybe I'll just restrict this to highest only. Um, turn that off and then see that I'm restricted even further to 2,637 parcels. So, you know, the workflow, uh, you know, here would, would perhaps be to, um, you know, look through, you know, whatever types of filters there might be uh, and the uh, ADU capacity analysis and say, okay, well, you know, my universe of ADUs is 2,637. Um, perhaps there is some combination of, um, uh, you know, incentives or, or, or local policies that could get me to some certain percentage of this. Uh, and this could be, you know, one assessment of, uh, of ADU capacity that, that we could recommend. So, with that, I'm going to stop the sharing. Also, um, being aware that uh, that I have some bandwidth issues, and then just open it up to uh, further discussion. And uh, and and Tom can help with that as well. Make sure to um, just uh, put your hand up or uh, put some info in the chat. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Kevin. Um, that was a great demo uh, with some you know uh, connection issues. But then again, um, that that comes back to that you know. Uh, list that we we were talking about earlier you can request this in detail uh, technical assistance so we can have a one-on-one -on -one session with you to go over in detail about the tools and the data behind it so you can have a better sense of what you can utilize for your housing element updates or even your environmental justice or um, safety element and um, just before we get into the the data uh, the question part um, you know in the presentation earlier I forgot to mention that um, part of the RDP right now we're doing is, you know, one of the immediate benefits that we are releasing uh, for local jurisdictions is our complementary licenses. So you can actually go on, um, you know, if you are from a local jurisdiction in the SCAC region, um, I just post that in, in the chat. You can actually re request a set of complementary GIS licenses and um, it's, it's from Esri and those licenses are RTS Pro, Urban Community Analyst, uh, hub, uh, and you can use those today to uh, assist you with the data that, that Kevin mentioned uh, from Helper, um, and then use some uh, uh, these tools for some spatial analysis. Um, and then so far we have already provided more than uh, these licenses to more than 120 jurisdictions in the region. So that's about 60%. So our goal is to hit 100%. Um, and and um, if you do know any jurisdiction in your in your communities, please let them know about these uh, great benefit from um, the RDP. A um, couple of good questions here from Axel. Hi, Axel. Um, good to hear from you. Um, he's asking, is, is um, so, you know, Step one here has been to develop a one-way information flow platform because um, that can be done a lot more efficiently and, and quickly to start with. So, um, you know, this is largely an extension of our existing open data uh, portal and the data that have been uh, available on there uh, for years that's a little bit more curated um, and, uh, you know, kind of discussed in the context uh, of, of uh, pilot jurisdictions as well to kind of assist us on, uh, you know, what's most useful for them. Uh, the bigger outcome output of the regional data platform is to build a, a, a more comprehensive and user-friendly two-way information flow system. We've used things like SPM, scenario planning models, data management service uh, to some extent in the past to, to have kind of the two-way data communication uh, and flow. Our objective is to have this become a little bit more ongoing. Um, however, that is a much heavier technical and design-based lift. Uh, than uh, kind of simply some, um, you know, uh, curated versions of, of existing open data. So that's the objective in the future is to have um, prudential logins with, with additional like actual active planning tools um, uh, with, uh, with ability for data updates uh, up and down uh, and, and better integration. Uh, but right now, uh, what you see here and what we're demoing is just the one-way information flow uh, where we're trying to curate our open data and make that a little bit more effective while we work on um, uh, building the, the, the larger platform. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. And, um, you know, also the question uh, he also, um, you know, also asked you is about, um, you know, the, the partnership and, and um, you know, the, the buy-ins from our partners. So, you know, uh, in the past several months or years, you know, we, we have presented this, um, the, the regional data platform RDP project to our um, committee, uh, subcommittee meetings um, at SCAC. And so these, uh, these groups are, uh, you know, elected official representing uh, each local jurisdiction in the SCAC region. So they are aware of uh, the efforts that we are working on. 
Um, so um, as we progress uh, to to make this this RDP more um, you know uh, more streamlined and um, mature the, the program a bit, so we continue to uh, outreach to local jurisdiction to provide updates um, about the process. And uh, in fact, you know this July um, at the ESRI user conference, we are uh, having a special interest group uh, to. Uh, to focus specifically on the regional data platform to give folks uh, updates about our progress and uh, what we have done so far in the last year. Um, so yeah, if you are interested in that, we can also uh, definitely reach out. Thanks. Any other questions or thoughts or, or shared experiences on this? Um, I see uh, a handful of, uh, of uh, SCAG jurisdiction local staff. I see a few of our um, uh, brother and sister MPOs uh, and, and, and COGS across the state. Um, I'm sure we have a lot of, uh, you know, kind of experience with data standardization and, and handling and such. Uh, I do have to say for, for my part or for our part, we launched this helper tool during the RENA appeals, which made some folks internally a little bit nervous. Um, uh, you know, because it, it, it is a, you know, clear and pub public demonstration, uh, you know, that's obviously the data has already been there uh, and, and always been able to be ac accessed. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, one of the things that we're trying to do certainly is, uh, you know, uh, provide, you know, data tools, information, not be, um, you know, and, and not, not be super, uh, you know, super concerned about, about that element because of, you know, just promoting, open, you know, openness and, and, and such. And, and we've been happy that it's, it's kind of been a great tool, uh, you know, we see more and more just for kind of exploring, uh, you know, the region. Um, one of the things I didn't share in the demo is, uh, you know, you can just kind of zoom out uh, and just see, you know, some of the overall land use patterns uh, or, you know, just take a look at where high quality transit areas are to get a flavor for that in one jurisdiction versus another. Have you guys gotten feedback from cities yet who have started to use this or other stakeholders who are not necessarily cities, but advocacy organizations who are interested in what kind of housing goes up in any given city as part of the arena process or the local housing element process? Tom has been working with the uh, our group of pilot jurisdictions, um, you know, and, and some of their uh, you know, feedback about, oh, we, you know, we would like some, uh, you know, cer certainly the two-way information flow, you know, we want to try to get that, that cranking and flowing. Uh, but unfortunately, that, that's, that's just more of a technical lift. We're hoping to, uh, you know, have that perhaps a little bit more toward the end of, of 2021 uh, as a part of getting our 2024 regional planning uh, cycle uh, started. So this is a lot of the kind of the prep work and leg work for that. Um, uh, but, you know, some of the little things like snapshots, infographics, uh, layer packages uh, are designed to make that flow a little bit easier. You know, one of the other things, uh, you know, us and a lot of the other MPOs are uh, doing now is REAP uh, funding and just a heck of a lot more uh, in housing than we've ever done. Uh, so certainly these things have always been able to kind of, uh, you know, assist in, in some sense with, with housing planning, but with the big numbers and uh, more and more requirements uh, coming down, there's more impetus for that. I know some of the uh, sub-regional uh, entities in Southern California are also, um, you know, uh, developing, you know, more platforms, more custom ArcGIS urban builds, uh, things like that to help their local jurisdictions even further. Um, one of the, the, the goals of this was to at least get the data flowing. Uh, to, to start that process, given that, um, you know, October is uh, is only, October 15th is exactly four months away. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. And wow. uh, I also wanted to add, um, you know, uh, since Josh is, you know, about to share his uh, questions, but um, I wanted to add, you know, um, the list, uh, which is also another way to really uh, uh, have uh, a two-way communication and data sharing capability, you know, uh, right now. So when one, that's one of the goals for the local information services team where we do connect with, when, uh, you know, we provide one-on-one -on -one technical assistance and through these technical assistance, uh, you know, there's a chance that we can do a, a robust communication back and forth between SCAG and member agencies. So we can actually gather feedback, input, or even updates to the data uh, that's happening right now. And you know, going forward, 
uh, with the regional data platform, you know, I mentioned that the regional information hub is one of, is going to be one of the key components in the RDP, and that's going to be a, a, a pretty much the one-stop shop where you can communicate between us uh, and provide that, you know, a feedback and provide that updated data or even request technical assistance. So that's a forthcoming. But yeah, Josh. Uh, so can you guys kind of elaborate a little bit more on that um, in that, um, you know, a lot of CTCs and COGS are also doing something very similar. And, um, you know, we, we have our REAP program going right now. There's ADU component there. There's AFFH component there. Um, there's a lot that's kind of similar in that path. And the diagram kind of, Tom, that you shared with the RDP kind of doesn't show where the CTCs and COGS kind of fit in <laughs> in the process. So if you can elaborate on that, that'd be great. Well, um, the, the, the program, so the data orchestration is that, that's when, um, you know, the, the, re, the, the integration and the streamlined data collecting and data sharing process happening uh, during that regional data platform. So, um, so I mentioned, you know, um, within that data orchestration. And one of the components is gonna be the regional information hub. And on this hub, you'll be able to review and access to all of the data um, and tools available uh, coming up from SCAG. But also at the same time, you'll be able to provide your feedback um, to the tools that we, uh, that we provide. And, um, another, um, another component to that too is that, um, you know, we are working on, and Kevin kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier uh, about the local input process, uh, where we are working on this uh, component into the RDP. And this is one, this is kind of similar to the SPM data management, if you, if you re remember. And um, this, you know, this is going to be similar to that, and you'll be able to provide your uh, feedback and communication back and forth between SCAC. Um, and I don't know if Kevin, you have anything else to uh, add to that? Yeah, you know, Josh, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and you know, honestly, the, the, the SCAG regional data platform started and I think procurement and scoping started well before REAP even became a thing. Uh, uh, so you know, it, it, uh, our efforts have been a little bit more to um, try to, uh, to link that in, in some points uh, where possible, um, you know, in certain the focus uh, of uh, the re uh, kind of funding and programming uh, is a little bit more on, uh, you know, specifically empowering the, the subregions, uh, uh, you know, the subregions to empower the local jurisdictions, you know, with the additional funding that they have as well uh, to develop things that work especially well for them. Uh, you know, as you look at, um, you know, a gigantic diverse region, it's almost a miracle that we have standardized land use categories that we can use for some purposes. But my goodness, there's a lot that we just don't, uh, and, and can't uh, provide that's all that specialized and, and specific. Um, so I, I think, uh, you know, Josh and you, you, you guys were working with, um, you know, someone to build out a little bit more uh, and a little bit more custom uh, type, uh, type stuff as well that, that services uh, local jurisdictions in, in, in a similar, but perhaps better and more detailed way. Okay. No, I, I think, yeah, going forward, yeah, um, partnerships is, is key. And uh, we've, we've had good relationship with, with kind of the local input process in the past. Um, if we need to kind of automate some of that local input process uh, that we had in the past, that'll be, that'll be great. Um, and look forward to kind of working with you on the next update of the SES. That is in the works and we'll be sharing more details as, as they become available. Um, and uh, yeah, Look forward to those uh, those conversations and work. Thanks. Well, I don't see any other um, you know kind of thoughts or questions. We've we've got a few minutes. Uh, any um, any questions on it? Has anyone played around with the tool and uh, tried to do something? Uh, we're here for a little while to <laughs> to help with that at the very least. Direct technical assistance. <laughs> <laughs> well, why not, right? <laughs> well, Josh, you can send in your technical assistance now. Nate, hey, what's up? Hey, <clears throat> hey, Kevin. So I, uh, I actually just emailed you and Tom about this, but I figured since you had the time, I'll, I'll just ask here. So I'm looking at your Belinda's ADU. Um, 
And when I just turn on the baseline, I'm actually surprised at um, how many parcels don't come up as eligible parcels, just given your Belinda's um, larger minimum lot size. Um, and anyway, I just thought I'd throw that out there as, uh, as a question, maybe something to, to take a look at and see if there's something obvious that uh, that's built into the, just into the, uh, the parameters that are there that might be restricting some parcels from coming up. I would have expected a lot more, I guess, a lot more par eligible parcels. Yeah, that's a good question. And Tom, I don't think fire hazard is built in there, right? You have to check that separately, which could be for your Belinda, perhaps, Nate. Uh, you know, one thing that, that can reduce the universe or, or slope as well. Yeah, and maybe, and maybe it's slope that's, that's built into there. Anyway, I just was curious what, what parameters, and if there's a way to check to see what are those baseline parameters that are built into there um, so that I can toggle around with that. The uh, full report has uh, the, the detailed listing of what goes into the baseline assumptions. Um, I can review that, uh, but it, it is linked in the chat there as well. And, you know, I think it's worth, worth noting too, um, these are generally pretty high. You know, if we're looking at 2.7 to 3 million parcels region wide, um, that I, you know, I would venture to guess that for almost all jurisdictions, that's more than the ADUs that are likely to develop. I don't, you know, uh, uh, well, I guess I can, I guess I can just check the population of Yorba Linda right here and, and compare the 13 or 14,000 uh, with that. Um, but, um, you know, it, it is pretty high in, in most, in most cases uh, in general. Yeah. Okay. I just, I'll, I'll check out the report and see what it says, but I was curious on that. Yeah, I mean, Nate, if, if you have like a spe uh, specific site that you, you have in mind and you think that it should be there, I mean, you can just let us know and we can just, you know, try to see if, if um, you know, the configuration is somewhat different, like how yeah. it would factor in. Yeah, We can chat offline about it, but I just thought I would raise that in case uh, others had, had seen something similar and they were scratching their heads, you know, wondering... How come, how come some of these aren't pulling up? Well, Nate, uh, if I may ask, be so bold as to ask you a question here that we have a minute or two. Um, you know, you, you've been doing a lot of work kind of on ADUs, I think with Orange County Council of Governments trying to assess, you know, ADU development potential likelihood, you know, uh, especially in terms of what to put on a housing element. Have you had any good, uh, you know, you know, kind of thoughts or perspectives on, uh, you know, ADU numbers or, or capacities or strategies to get to that? You know, I think a lot of it varies from city to city. You know, we're seeing um, some parts of Orange County where they've just taken off with, with tons and tons of applications. That's like, they're overwhelmed with the number of applications that are coming through. Um, and then and there's others that uh, aren't, aren't quite seeing that same level. Uh, so I, I really think it varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, whether they've op um adopted their own ordinance already, whether they're operating under the state guidelines, um, whether they're close to universities. I know like Orange, for example, was seeing some issues uh, because of the proximity to the university. Um, and so they were really seeing an influx in ADUs. And um, yeah, so I, th I think it all just varies across the board. Cool, well, thanks for that tip. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other uh, kind of thoughts or questions or else we'll, uh, I think we'll close it out. All right. Well, hey, thanks everyone again. And uh, to close out uh, yet another demographic workshop and I'll see you all next time. Thank you everybody.